All right. Good morning and welcome to yet another Dr. Spotify session. Um, this is Minerva Datta, and today we have with us um, Dr. Vishakha Muchu, Sean Riley, and myself presenting to you Dr. Spotify. Um, again, to reinforce the motto of Dr. Spotify, learning is not driven by answers, but by questions. Um, let's go ahead. So this is the crew. Uh, we have with us Dr. Vishakha Muchu, um, BJ Rajdev, um, myself, Minerva Datta, and Alexis Kuszynski. Today, um, we also have with us um, Sean Riley, who's um, working with us for some time and is um, going to help uh, present Dr. Spotfire from um, a support engineer's perspective. So before we get started, let me reinforce that we're all based out of uh, Palo Alto, except uh, Sean, who's based out of, um, Sean, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Boston? Yep, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we're all over the globe. Um, just a slide for the disclaimer, and now we will get started. All right, so quick introduction. Um, I am um, an SP. Oops, let's make this bigger. Okay. So I am an SP in the pre sales org at TIPCO, and I work with um, OEM customers. So OEM, in the case of Spotfire, is um, a very beautiful concept wherein uh, industry experts who have had experience and expertise in analytics uh, want um, an analytics platform and they choose Spotify to do it. They put in their intellect, their IP into uh, this offering and roll it out to customers. So today's featured session that would be by me would um, take into account a few questions that many OEM customers commonly ask. Um, and to start with, um, I classify these questions in a chunk of buckets. To start with, the first kind of question that I, that I come across is, um, do you guys take in data from a RESTful web service? So yes, we do, and we do it by a bunch of methods. Um, most of this is available online, but there were a few nuances that I wanted to walk through. So getting started with the methods or, or the ways in which we can access data through um, a REST-based web service would be the following. So the first thing is we could do it through OData. So getting into um, the nuances of OData, um, so REST is a standard for accessing resources on the web. Um, but REST is also a very generic standard. So uh, for example, if I wanted to push a REST-based web service for accessing a relational database, I would end up you know, inventing a lot of my own protocols on top of REST. But that's where OData provides its value. OData is based on REST, but it adds all the necessary standards for you know, APIs, metadata, for um, URI-based querying for standardized data representation, so on and so forth. Um, so in order to access a REST-based web service through OData, Spotify has a very easy um, a connection to, to make it, uh, to just get connected to it. So we have a bunch of examples. First, let's go through a, a walkthrough for this example. I have data from the cityofchicago.org, which provides public data. Right here, I am using no authentication method, and I say connect. Ideally, it should get connected without any errors, and I should be able to see a bunch of data tables that are available um, inside this database. So here I go. I could choose anything and use it the same way that I use um, a generic data connector, and uh, it would allow me, as we will see further here, 
the ability to choose whether I want to have prompting, if I want to have prompting by a certain field, if I want to cache the data table, if I want to load the data table on demand, so on and so forth. It's everything that you expect from Spotfire bringing in data at that point. So while this is a very simple walkthrough of OData, um, oops, it says username and password incorrect. Let's see. Okay, um, I had to authenticate this URL. But you get the idea. You could try. Um, the the nuance that I wanted to highlight here was um, that imagine that if you wanted a button that could automate the process of getting new data and appending rows after this data table is bought in, such that, such that fresh data always comes into your data table, that is a very easy thing to do. So the, the funny thing here is, let's cancel this and try this again, because I was connecting to this a little while uh, earlier, and it gave me no problems at all. So maybe that data table has a problem. Try this again. So I don't have an authentication method. This is open public data. And I can choose one of the data tables that I have looked at. Mm. Let's see. Okay. And I see that something's happening. Let's go ahead and add this to the table. This is a more simplistic one. Let's import data table and hit OK. And it worked. So the basic idea is um, it's seamless connection to a REST-based um, web service that, um, that is compliant with the OData standard. So having understood this, I wanted to point out a few nuances. Um, the first one is that while accessing SharePoint data, this is after I went through um, um, our community articles on the theme, I found out a few things that I wanted to highlight. Now, SharePoint has a way of putting in the URI. So the URI, as you saw, open data for Chicago, had a certain structure. For SharePoint, you need to comply with a certain structure wherein you have to uh, modify the URL. And this is because sometimes an API expects a certain structure, and it has nothing to do with Spotify in that case. Um, the second thing that was important, and I could share the link afterward, is um, one of our videos on our Spotify page that tells you exactly how the kind of steps that I went through. And um, there's an article on our community about it as well. The third thing, and the third most documented thing is, on our tips and tricks blog, we have a few um, um, examples of how to bring in data. The, the nuance here is that by working to get this data, somehow um, a few tables in the Socrata API, specifically this one, didn't work for me. And I installed a hotfix. My best guess is that that data table was unavailable at the point. So just keep in mind that if it doesn't work with a certain um, certain URI, check your authentication methods, check if the web service still exists. Um, and this is a, a repeated pattern that I saw in a topic that I'm going to cover a little um, further as well. So well, um, OData was the first way of doing this. The second thing that could be done um, to get in data from the REST-based web service would be to use an iron Python script. Now, um, again, if you go into the archives, we have extensive documentation. The web is replete with examples where in Spotfire can use iron Python to get uh, a series of uh, data tables from any web source. The important thing to remember here, this code works seamlessly, but the Yahoo API is deprecated. So if you wanted to use it, you could use another API. In my case, I have used one of the examples that uh, works very well, and we could walk through this example as well. So let's see how we could get in data by putting in uh, this chunk of code inside Spotfire to bring in a data table. So let's start with the simplest feature of 
going ahead and putting in a text box. I go ahead and edit my text box and insert action control to put a script. Now, I was already designed with this script, but just to be thorough here, I do paste my script right here. I know one thing that I need to comment this out for this to work is just now. And I'm going to call this script rest data. Now, when I run this script, ideally, there is no hassle, so I know that um, my output is working. I can go ahead and try and see if this works. It gives me a problem, and that can be sorted out. Let me just do this once more. All right. So the thing here is we will walk through the code but basically, my data table now has um, now has um, a, a table called countries inside it, and we will understand how that happened. This we validate that. Uh, let me say OK. Let me call this button press and click OK. Now I have a button here. So whenever I press this button, um, the script will get executed, and I will have an additional data table called countries. Now, the contents of country are, are so on and so forth, right? So this is a very simplistic walkthrough. One of the more complicated walkthroughs can be um, as seen here. By complicated, I mean uh, full of different kinds of features. Now, this is a web service called OSRM service. It's a beautiful example that takes in um, the latitude and longitude of uh, a place and gets the desired route. And then we use Spotfire to map it onto our Spotfire map layer. Mm, so again, this uses the same script. And if you want, you could try it as well. I could share the link. Um, a shout out to Nemo's notes. They are. Um, a blog and I believe a customer, and they've documented this uh, a little better than what we see here. And they've also added a very cool functionality wherein they have called an API inside this setting that reverses your codes point A and point B. So you can actually put in human readable addresses for point A and point B and get the same functionality. So, um, all right, having said that, we've covered our Iron Python. Um, chunk of this, the last way to do this would be through a tear script. I actually came across a really cool portal as well, but uh, uh, to stick to the point, the tear script option is, um, as I was reading in the community, maybe the easiest, but that depends. So my expertise is probably not tear script, so I didn't try it hands-on. But um, Dave Lee has given an example of um, how to use maybe, you know, in, in, put in three lines of code and be able to get in a data table to an R package. So while this is another way in which you can do it, and it might just be the way that is most appropriate to your application, um, it, is definite, it definitely can be done through tear as well. The one thing to remember, though, as was pointed out by Dave in his examples, um, was that often you get data that's high R tier um, if you are using XML and uh, Spotify data tables take in um, like a tabular format with a row and column. Uh, so if you wanted to use um, pair, you would have to map the hierarchies just to get it in. Um, all right, so having said that, we are done with the part wherein I wanted to show that there were multiple ways through which you could use scripts inside Spotify or get data inside Spotify with, with or without scripting. Um, this was specific to the web services chunk. Now, going into another topic that I come across very often um, is about Spotify extensibility. Now, I know that we have um, covered a few points about extensions in Spotify. But I wanted to give a holistic picture here. Spotify is being embedded as you know your product in in another organization needs 
to, you know, look and feel like you're offering. Often we have clients who have exactly the picture of their product in mind, and they want Spotify to mold into that identity. So we have a bunch of uh, options to, you know, make Spotify extensible above and beyond what is already available. So my first take on um, customers wanting to extend the platform is get to know the product as is, and then look at the extensibility options. But being a Dr. Spotify audience here, I am pretty sure that we are well versed with uh, the product functionality and capability. So let me tell you how it can be extended above and beyond based on the three logical tiers that we have here. So um, on the client tier, we are talking about um, you know, Spotify analysts. So in the analyst setting, you have Iron Python scripting, you have extensions using C Sharp in the .NET API, and you have statistical scripting. Now, many people ask me the differences between Iron Python scripting and C Sharp scripting, um, and I would point out to a few articles on the community, but the easy answer is um, to C Sharp, you have more control because you have access to the entire DOM object and you can create new objects as well. And the other advantage is that this um, is the word transaction. So basically, you can have concurrent transactions on C-sharp, and on Iron Python, you have to wait for one transaction or one script to execute. And this might take some time, depending on your payload, depending on the operation the script is performing. So you need to choose based on your need at that point. Let's come to the second tier, that is the security and the routing tier. So the Spotify server is very extensible um, from a security perspective, from an information services perspective. Also, we have web services that control the Spotify library, the user directory, the information model. And this is an area that many clients are very well versed with because um, I think by installation, you look at these aspects more thoroughly. On the worker service tier, we have a bunch of offerings that can be seen. Let's start with the statistical services. Out of the box, Spotfire can be extended to work with MATLAB, SAS, we already have here. Um, on the automation services side, we do give custom tasks. Uh, we do give you the ability to make custom tasks or automate custom tasks using the C Sharp API. And we have the web service for initiating automation as well. The Spotify web player, and this is an area that has been covered in the past, um, has a JavaScript API. So as you all know, the web player is a, a browser-based client that interacts with the server to get an analysis and then renders it as JavaScript and HTML payload on the browser. So the Spotify web server has a JavaScript API that can help you, um, you know, extend the nuances of JavaScript inside. It also has Iron Python scripting support. Um, in addition, the underlying .NET API exists, and um, this is something that's important because you can have scheduled updates uh, for web services in, um, in this area, and this is something that is very well documented in our manuals as well wherein you want an analysis to load, um, say, in off hours, in non-working hours for your office, you use the scheduled update feature to um, you know, get data loaded faster. So this is the broad picture of the Spotify extensibility platform. Um, now, I think I've covered the nuances of this area. Often our clients are very familiar with the uh, Iron Python scripting area because we have uh, many examples and many blogs documenting the same. Um, the .NET API um, has good documentation on our website, but it might not be as verbose as people would like it to be. So we're working on that side of things uh, by bringing in more courses. Um, all right, let me get to a better area here. Yeah. So the Spotify client extensibility um, is often a question mark, but this diagram depicts it very well. 
Um, so what is it that can be extended in a spot fire document, right? Um, you can extend um, the main document consists of pages, banners, and a data manager. In the brackets, you see what exactly is a page, what exactly does a panel consist of, and what exactly constitutes a data manager. Now, the API can um, modify these three aspects of your visualization. And it happens through by interacting with the underlying .NET extensibility platform. So uh, without delving into too many technicalities, let me show you what exactly extensibility could mean right here. So if you were um, now, OK, this is the cool part. Uh, I have uh, the XP embedded. I'm basically showing it in a static S3 page right here. And uh, what I'm trying to show is what can you find through extensibility options, right? So one thing that could happen is you could have um, a new icon um, made. So for example, this is the JSViz icon. Uh, I just hover here in case there's a delay. Notice my mouse. The JSViz icon has the ability, say your organization is heavily into donut charts. That Spotify doesn't offer out of the box, but you can configure it via our JSViz extension. So you can have a custom tool. I know this is a small nuance, but your customers will get a, a button out of the box to make that donut chart. That's one option of extensibility. JSMIS is something they're very well aware of. So the Venn diagram is a popular thing with a few OEM customers that I saw. So the Venn diagram is an option. You could have the option of um, custom panels. So you could have a panel showing, um, you know, in this case, molecular structure, you could show the most optimum route, or in case of one of our customers, the floor plan of their uh, manufacturing unit such that if you click a certain area, the data table changes on that visualization, on the visualization on the right. Um, you could also have a browser trigger. So this is fun because if you trigger something on your data table, it could lead to another analysis. In this case, it calls the browser. Um, and it could lead to the Wikipedia page of the uh, item that you are interested in. Um, a simple walkthrough, um, okay, that's not the one. A simple walkthrough of what you would need to extend Spotfire is in these um, nine bullets. But a more visual walkthrough is right here. Okay. I'm I'm looking at this one, yeah. So let me get started. Don't get intimidated by the many blocks here. Um, so basically, what would happen here is you would have your examples for, say, custom code and API that you would put, bring into Visual Studio or program inside Visual Studio. Now, Visual Studio would um, make an SDK file, and you could run and debug in your Spotify sandbox environment right here, um, and push it to the Spotify package builder onto the Spotify server right here. Now, the Spotify server has the ability to roll out um, updates in the client, be it the browser-based client or the analyst client. And that would be the flow of execution for rolling out a new update or an extensibility um, feature that you have programmed or bought into Spotify. All right, so that was it for me. Sean, I can go ahead and pass the control to you. All right. All right. All your OK. <clears throat> So I uh, have some questions from the forum, which I can go over uh, in detail. Um, but if anyone has any questions, uh, then just please post those in the chat, and we'll, um, I can uh, take a stab at those as well, OK? Um, OK, so so the first um, question was uh, relating kind of uh, data management within um, within the, the analyst client. 
um, specifically around uh, splitting columns and transforming that data. So that's a common um, scenario needed just for basic data manipulation and data management. Um, so uh, this particular question has um, data in this form with a few columns and a few um, uh, separated values, a semicolon separated values that they're looking to break out and transform into a, you know, a more usable form so that they can, um, so that they can visualize that a little easier. Um, so here's the data table that it ha which, uh, which they're starting with. Um, and the, the easiest way to do this uh, is, is essentially with uh, the relatively new split feature. So um, within the data panel, um, we can select the column that you want to work on. So this is the products column. Um, we can expand the data panel, and we have these new features. Which um, and so the, the split the split action is here, which allows us to, to very easily uh, break this out. So it, it even automatically detects the the separator, which is a semicolon, um, and identifies the number of new columns to um, to break this out into. Now, if you have you don't know how many values are going to be here, you need to increase this, um, you know, to so ensure that you have your max number of columns, resulting columns um, here. And then all you need to do is click OK. And that creates this new set of, of columns. And if we look at actually the, the, table, the table, which is being used here, um, we can actually see um, this is essentially just a, a really easy way to create these columns where we're using this, the split function and breaking that out. Um, so now we have um, we have these new columns in our in our table in our table here, um, which we can add into view. Um, but what they what this is still not um, as extremely usable and uh, not to essentially get all of these products within a single column, right? So. Uh, to to break out how they how how it's needed here to for example use in, in other visualizations uh, we need to transform that data and we can do that um, using um, we can do that using an unpivot um, so there are you know we can essentially insert tra insert transformations um, within multiple ways so um, you can do this uh, there's a few ways to do that you can insert direct directly going to insert transformations um, or you can kind of non-destructively do that um, sometimes we'll also just add in a new data table um, pointing to our original table right um, we're going to insert our unpivot transformation and now here we just need to define which columns we're going to transform and which ones we're going to pass through. So in our, in our end result, we really want to keep ID and state in their same form so we can pass those through, ID and state. And our new split uh, columns are what we want to transform, which means we're going to take those four columns and we're going to uh, transform them into a, uh, into a, into a new column here. So we have our, our uh, category, we have our value. We can uncheck include empty values, which which will now take care of all of the uh, rows where we did not have an option. And we can click OK. And so if we now look at our table, our newly inserted pivot table, we have all the data transformed uh, with our IDs, our states, and now that that data, which was in a single a single cell, um, separated out and and put into a, a single column, which we can uh, very clearly uh, work with in in other visualizations. So another um, example which uh, comes up a lot is. Um, ranking data and how to have that work um, dynamically as well. So for this particular um, question, they were looking to dynamically rank their data. Um, and with, this was within a graphical table. So um, by default, you know, if you create a calculated column, those expressions, those values will be uh, across the, will be evaluated across the entire data set and um, will not change based on filtering or marking along those lines. 
but uh, within a visualization of those expressions you have on the axes here um, are dynamic. And so within this cross table, we're able to, we can essentially dynamically rank these results. So there's a calculated value here, um, which we can see is based on sum of total. And so this, uh, we can uh, essentially dynamically rank this and so that it can, it will then also uh, change based on filtering. So we can do this by, uh, we're going to insert a new a calculated value. So I go into the properties, to the axes, and I'm going to add a new calculated value. And so it, the default expression here, we're going to go in and we're, we're actually working on, um, on uh, sum of total. That's what this calculated value is. So let's keep it the same, sum of total. Um, but we also, now we want to essentially rank that, uh, rank these, these results based on this categorical grouping. So we can do that um, if we edit the custom expression. Um, by probably the best way to do that is we can use the, the then keyword, which essentially takes our our aggregation results. So the sum total results in these four values um, based on the categorical grouping. So the then will then allow us to pass those aggregated values, and we can now pass them to a rank function or dense rank, depending on how you want to calculate that. So value is, a, is another keyword, which is now going to be reference, a special, uh, has special meaning, which is now referencing the results of the, of the expression before the then keyword. And we want to uh, rank the value, and we want, well, let's, let's say we'll rank descending so we can see the, the, the highest total, we want that to be first. So now we can click OK. We've inserted our new calculated value. And now we have a dynamic ranking here. So we already have our uh, ranking in place. And what we can do is now, since this is an expression um, within a visualization, it, will, it is dynamic and uh, updates based on the filtering um, within the visualization. So uh, another question it was on um, cross tables, and this uh, comes up a lot, um, where there might be different values within the cross table. So here, um, and there wants the you need to have essentially a comparison of that data. Um, so here's an example data set um, where we've got you know a bunch of uh, you know uh, orders over time. So we have some timestamps with various dates, some business locations of various cities, and some totals. And in our cross table, um, whoops, I, I'll undo my filtering. Um, so here's a sample cross table, which, uh, the starting which might be the starting point, where we've got it, uh, the business location on our, our vertical categorical axis. Uh, we have the year of, the trend of uh, my date um, on, the, on the horizontal axis on top. And we just have sum of total within the cell value. So essentially, we're we're, we're calculating the the sum of the total uh, within each within each business location, you know, by year. Uh, if we look at this question, what they're looking to do is is essentially uh, look at the previous year's totals, uh, the current year's totals, and uh, and then perform a comparison, doing with current year minus uh, minus the previous year. So, and they were specifically asking, well, how would we do that with an over function? Okay. So, if we go back here, um, to have this, they're, they're actually looking to break that out into multiple uh, cross tables. There are multiple ways you could do this. Um, so, I'll kind of step through, uh, yeah, step through doing, step through do, doing that. So, for this first table here, um, we can make this be, I mean, the current year right now is, of course, 2017. So, the previous year would be 2016. So, the easiest way to, to do that is if we go look at um, going to the properties uh, data, and we can actually limit the data within, the, within this particular visualization using an expression, using limit data using expression. So, in this case, what we want to do is we want to look at uh, the year of, of uh, the date. And what we want, we want to make sure that that is equal to um, the current year minus one. So that will be the previous year. So we can use the year function. Um, 
the date time now function to pull in the current date time and subtract one from that. So that will be 2017 minus one is 2016. And click OK. And now we've isolated this since we have just the 2016, 2016 data, since they wanted to have these as three, uh, th three unique cross tables. So we can e easily modify that logic a little bit to show the current year dynamically by going back to the same limit data using expression. But now we can just say that the year of my data is equal to the, to the year, the current year of year of date time now by and eliminating the minus one. Okay. So this is the, this is fairly uh, the simple part, right, where we have just isolating the years within a cross table. Um, now we need to look at how to um, compare those values, essentially. Now, since we want to compare two years of values, uh, we cannot do that uh, using the exact same limit data using an expression. We can't eliminate those values from, um, eliminate those data rows from the, the visualization. Otherwise, we won't be able to compare them. So this type of uh, year my date is, is, will be a little too limiting for us at this point. So we can remove this at the, at, at right now. Um, and there are a couple ways you can go about comparing those values. So the, the question was originally asked, well, how can I do that using the over function? Um, so we can do that with essentially, um, so right now we have sum of total down here. And um, we can add in a new value here. Um, so I'm going to go into custom expression. Here is our sum total. And now we can add in a new, uh, a new expression, which will create a new column in our cross table. Now there'll be some side effects of that, which we'll kind of work with and, and see what makes sense. But um, essentially what we want to do is, you know, we're still, now we are um, summing that same total. Um, but we also, now we want to essentially compare that to the previous year. And since the years are columns, um, we're going to use an over function to, uh, to navigate the, the cell, navigate those columns for that comparison. So we can do sum total, and now we, need, now we use the over function to change the scope of what that uh, is, is being evaluated against. So we can use sum over, and since we want to go to the, the previous column, we want 2017, uh, we want to compare against the previous year, which is 2016. So this is the previous column. So what we can do is we can use the previous function and compare that against axis columns. And now we get this warning that with multiple cell values, since we have multiple expressions down here, um, we need to reference column names. And we can do that um, by up in the vertical axis. And so what, what this gives us is um, a little, there's a, a good bit of noise here. So um, let's maybe even clean up and give an alias to this um, as change from previous. And so in this first column, there is no result here because there is no year, there is no previous year. But here we see the actually what, you know, where uh, the question was getting about. Here we actually do see that change. We see the current year uh, minus the previous year. So here's the value of what we want. But um, since this is done within the framework of the cross table, we have these extra columns. Essentially, we have this defined for every year um, within our, 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 uh, our, our, net, our hierarchy on this top level. So there's a different way to do this, though, where we can get both of those. Uh, we can get um, just this 2016 total, just this 2017 total, and then this difference. So we can do this with a new, uh, a new cross table. Uh, where this time we're going to just have column names the top. We still have our business location on the left. Uh, but now we're going to do this um, just within our custom, just within our cell values here. So what we can do is we can add in that kind of restricting logic by looking at years and, um, and do that all within the cell values so that we'll just have the columns that we're looking for. So um, just to save a little typing, so for example, um, let me paste this over. 
So here is that same uh, similar expression what we did. Um, we're, we're doing a sum of total, right? Um, but what we're going to do is we can just add in an expression. And it, we're going to wrap that total in an if clause. So where we have that same year comparison. So we're saying if year of my date, my date is equal to the year of date time now, then that's the current year. So here's is where uh, we, here's what lets us isolate the data just to the current year's data, and then we're going to sum that. And if we just click OK to show that, now we have our current year data in a single column. And following that same logic, um, we can we can add in another one for the previous year. So it's going to be essentially the same thing. except we need to add on a minus one, so, so we are comparing it against the previous year. Okay. So let me add in our more complex aliases here. That's previous year. And now we have our previous year, 2016. And to compare that, all we, all we need to do is essentially use these same two expressions in the comparison. So we can say sum of current year, and we want to compare that against, uh, get, find the delta from the previous year, so minus the previous years. And now we have current minus previous. And so this is one way to, instead of using the over function within a cross table, um, to more succinctly um, provide just the data you want within a cross table. So here we see the current year's sales totals, the previous year's, and that difference. So, um, so another um, Uh, another question that was posted was um, how to read a, a, a visual, how to read a, an image, uh, a ping image, PNG image, um, from file, from disk, and display that in a text area. So if we um, come back here, oh. so if we open this up, um, here we see the question. They have a they have a ping uh, a PNG file that they want to um, import into Spotfire and display in their uh, display in their analysis. So there are already a few KBs on this, but it involves a few you know some scripting and a few different pieces. Um, so uh, I thought this could be a good way to walk through essentially. So. Um, those KBs are, are, are will be here for as, you know for reference, and we can post those. Um, but to create this, essentially, what we need to do is um, uh, if we open up this data function, um, what we're doing is we're defining the path of where my file is located, and I have that you know just in a in a, in a temp folder here, um, right here. So I've got I have an image, um, and this was actually generated. Um, by Spotfire, um, and then saved out here. I and mean, that's you know you can. This is this scenario is normally used where you have maybe more dynamically generated images, and you need to uh, constantly pull those into Spotfire and display those updated uh, con that the updated content. But um, here I but you know I have a ping on on file here, and so what I do is I define the path um, where where that is. Uh, I'm defining my my file name, uh, which is the the full the full path and file name. So I'm I'm pasting in the path, which is my C my graphics test directory, um, with my plot PNG. And since these are uh, backslashes, they need to have doubles. Um, if you're forward slashes, you can have single. Um, we then define a connection to that, so we can essentially read that file. So um, we're we're initiating that. Uh, we're uh, adding this with uh, defining my connection here um, by reading that to the file. Um, we're reading. We're using the read bin function um, to read in the binary data for for that image for that file and storing that in the binary value, and then binary value property. And then we close the connection. And then what um, is done is 
So the question they asked was how to display it either in a table or in a text area. So we, could, we save this out right now in two different areas. We save it out as a table. So we're forcing that as a, into a data frame, as data frame, um, where we had passed that, that binary value. And we're also passed that binary value directly to a, um, a property, a prop output. So these two output, these are our two output parameters, which are defined here. So table output is defined as a table, prop output as a, as a value, so that lines up with our document property. And so now if we run this function, what is updated is a document property and our new table. So we can see the document properties under edit document properties. Here is our, um, our graph PNG, uh, which I don't see our, my binary value yet. So read PNG, let's check our parameters. So here uh, we've got, now we can check the parameters which line up the, the data function um, output parameters and actually map them to uh, elements within the analysis file. So we have our table output is um, replacing the existing table table output. Um, our prop output is a document property and uh, we'll match that up with graph PNG. So we say yes, that's fine. And now we can take a look at our oops, document properties. And now we have a binary value displayed within this document property. So that binary value is actually the binary data of that ping file. So what we can do is to display that within Spotfire. Now that we have, we've, we've used that data function to read the PNG file and store it as binary data in multiple ways within Spotfire. So within a text area, that's uh, very simple to do actually. So we, we edit our text area, so we can right click, edit text area, and all we need to do is insert a label. So a label allows you to uh, display the value of a property. And uh, so we can just select our graph PNG binary data type property. And since it is a, um, an image file that is automatically rendered as the image in the text area. Now we also save that as, uh, as a data table. Um, so we can insert a table visualization. And table output was the output of that data function. And we can already see that um, that binary data is displayed here. And so this is now constrained by the size of the, of the single cell of this data table. Um, but you can, you can essentially uh, stretch the width and within the appearance, you can increase that data row height to give your image more room to display. So there are multiple KBs which, uh, which discuss um, this topic, um, and those are linked here. Um, so, you know, the first one is, is kind of creating and reading um, images with tear. Um, and this is, you know, since tear does not have, uh, does not, uh, we use Spotfire for uh, the, the visualization part of it, tear does not have, uh, have uh, graphics capabilities. But this is, this particular post is, is referencing um, the R&R &R library, where we can reference an existing R, um, an existing R installation um, and, you know, create an image using, an, um, using the R engine uh, locally installed and, you know, do that within Tear. Um, and so this has some examples for how you could um, create images in that way um, as well as uh, read them in as uh, in their binary form so that we can use them just as we did. And the, um, the example of displaying that is uh, linked here with, a, uh, with another KB article ex explaining how, to, how you could insert that and reference that within your, 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 your DXP file once you have that created, once you have that binary data. So I have one more um, post from the forum, um, which was <clears throat> the, um, someone was looking to do a, um, a filter data using a multi-line input box. So they have data 
um, with student names and IDs, and they want to be able to enter a set of values in a multi-line input box and have that limit the, um, the data in their, in their visualization. Now this, um, there's some complexity here when we start to look at how to handle that multi-line input um, and how to use that to essentially filter uh, the values in a data table. And another complexity is um, the pro one of the problems that they mention is that if they enter the student ID 1, they want that to be an exact search. They don't want 1 to match 1, 11, 21 exactly. So they want it to be a, a complete exact match and not, uh, not a partial match. So to do that, um, we need to have our, uh, our multi-line input box. So in our text area, we're going to edit our text area. We're going to insert our uh, input field, multiple lines. And um, I'll also name it uh, multi-line input, which exists. So we'll say multi-line input uh, type string. So if it doesn't, if you don't have one, you can create one. Um, type string, click OK. So click OK, and now we have our multi-line input box. And that's, we're going to be entering our few. OK. So now we have our, our, our inbox here. So now we could, you know, we could enter our, our data that we want to work with, for example. And so this is what, the, what the, the question really wanted. They wanted a way to say, okay, I've got, um, you know, I've got all these IDs. I want to pull back just these users and filter my data based on that. So I'm using uh, the baseball demo data table here. So I have a, a, a number of names of baseball players. So that's what we'll filter on. So to do this, um, we're going to want to uh, limit the data in this visualization based on what we've passed here. So we can do that. Um, there's a few ways. We can, uh, going back to limit data, limit data using expression, we can write an expression which takes the input from our, our text area and using that to limit what's displayed here in the text area, what's displayed here in the table visualization. So uh, maybe, let me, let me add in a name or two here just so to give us a starting point. So Diaz, I see one, uh, and let's say Bob Boone. Okay. Okay. So we have a couple names here just as, a, as an example. Um, so now we have some data to work with. So we're going to uh, now start to create our expression, which is going to parse this data and make sure we get exact matches here. So what we want to do is, um, you know, one one way that's um, you know we can one way that we can do this essentially is um, search for those values essentially um, search for the names in each row and find it within our multi-line input um, string. Now the multi-line input um, is you know it does have multiple um, it's separated by new lines essentially. So what we need to do is we need to take the new lines from, uh, from this multi-line inbox and modify those in a way that allows us to get access to uh, and, and to be able to search in a single string. So here's um, a more complex expression and I'll start to break it down to explain what we're doing here. Okay, so this was, um, if we go back and show what we're doing. So essentially, um, let me make this a little easier to see. Okay, so we've got our, our couple names, um, and we see it filtered. So what this is doing, a couple things. So first off, um, we need to replace, again, replace those new lines with something else. And so what this is doing is I'm using um, Rx replace. So this is using regular expression, um, but it's a uh, regular expression in general is extremely powerful and useful for any type of these string modifications. Um, but this is just substituting. So what I'm doing is I'm taking, um, our multi-line input, right? So if we look at the, the actual value of that, we don't see the line breaks in this, but if you mouse over, you actually see the, the value of that property. So we have Odiaz, um, new line, Bob Boone, okay? 
So what this is doing is we're just saying we're, we're taking our, our multi-line input, our, our string with line breaks. Um, I'm looking for, um, and this is a special character, this backslash n, which is uh, a new line character. So I find my new line character, and I'm just going to replace it with a comma. That's what it's doing. So that's going to take Bo Diaz and Bob Dune, Bob Boone, and change that into this. And let me do this in Notepad so it's not confusing. So it changes it into a format like that. Now, there's still one problem that they had was that they don't want um, partial matches. Okay, so with this scenario, it um, you could find if you had if you had two uh, baboons, for example. So if we had if there was a value over here um, called baboon and baboon two, if you typed in baboon, that would match baboon two. Since if we're uh, based on how we're searching, so what we're, do, we're essentially what we're doing is now we're saying we're just using the find function to say um, find find my name in my you know newly parsed and flattened to a single line multi-line input. The way we can force uh, an exact match is by wrapping both our search string and um, our multi-line input um, in in a in our separator. So the way this is done is essentially we're taking, since we're doing a find function, we're finding the name. So for example, our name is Bo Diaz, right? And this is what we are searching in. So we're just looking for this string in the string. What we can do is wrap our search string, which is our the value in our data table. We can wrap that in, in our separator. So we can say we're going to search for this. And we're going to search for it in our multi-line input. But we're also going to wrap this in in our separators. So now we need to, if we search for this, we're only going to get exact matches. So we're using these bookends as a way to force exact matches in our searching. And that's what we're doing here with our uh, multiple clauses. So this first one is where we are taking a comma and we're using a concatenate and the shorthand and. So we're adding in our comma, the name from our data table, and a comma. So that gives us this first portion here. And then we do is we're finding this needle in this haystack. And this haystack is the same thing. We have our, our comma at the beginning. We have our the result of our, our flat into a single line, multi-line input. And we add on a, a final, final comma which gives us this. So this book ending, book ending allows you to have a complete uh, exact match only. And since it's a find function, it returns uh, positive if it is found. And so we're, we're, in sh we're saying that find is greater than zero. So if, it, if find is greater than zero, then that particular row matched one of the values, one of the lines. Okay, so those are a few examples um, of questions from the forum. Um, yep, I think that's you know all I had on uh, from my end. We can, if there are any other questions, we can we can take those. Um, I'm, I'm che Sean. I'm checking the question and answers panel just to double check if we have something new. Mm. Um, I think we're okay. We don't have any questions right now. Um, um, just to the audience, a note, in case you do have a question, feel free to reach out to us um, on the community or as uh, we pointed out in the chat box with the um, hashtag Dr. Spotfire um, added so that we can pick up your questions and answer them. But uh, for now, I think we're all set. Thank you so much for your attendance and attention. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in the next session.